Today's show is brought to you by Stream Tech Drift Boats, the world's most versatile drift boat. Find them at www.streamtechboats.com. I kind of feel bad for these people, but at the same time, I don't because they're stupid. <laughs> don't see a circle around yourself. Just start pissing everywhere. Oh, I hate the Dutch. <laughs> Welcome to our country. So. She looks. She doesn't really look Canadian. She looks almost American. <laughs> just insulted <laughs> all of Canada. <laughs> oh, every time I see something, something you got to... <laughs> If I'd known that before, I would have just, like, interspaced every other sentence with something horrible. Well, I haven't yeah. felt my feet since I sat down in the chair. <laughs> Can you see your feet, though? Uh, no. You know, I'd rather do anything else on the planet than go tip a cow over. How about Canada? Is there any stream access issues up in Canada? Nobody cares. Very much. <laughs> Kids, if you don't understand that joke, ask your parents. Evan, Derek? Yeah. Oh, crap. Here it comes. Your flies are open. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Grab hold of your flies. This is a podcast for nymphers, strippers, swingers, and dry fly guys. It's the show that brings you stories, instruction, and conservation from three guys who live it every day. This is The Open Fly. Coming to you from the number one small town destination in Washington? Tiny town number two. Tiny town number two. Yeah. What's the number two? Uh, There's one better than we're us? We're the runner-up. Yeah, Port, oh. Port Townsend. Oh. Oh, uh, you got to love Port Townsend. Well, that one makes more sense. It does. There's actually things to drive there and go do. I don't know why anybody drive to Duval uh, for an afternoon. To, for our municipal brown trout hatchery. <laughs> Take a tour. <laughs> yeah. Feed the fish. <laughs> Never Too underestimate sure. the general public's... Uh, sense of taste. Is yeah. Cool. yeah. Plus, we get the new Duval Tavern, which is not new but revitalized. The new old Duval Tavern. Yeah. I don't know if you can ever get served. It's well, my experience so far. Yeah, I, I had great service. Yeah, I think they were they were uh, profiling you, Evan. Yeah. Well, they've profiled <laughs> me the three times that I've been there, so I'll give them a few months to figure <laughs> figure their shit out. Yeah. Well. <laughs> so yeah, I guess that means uh, we're now fam- du- Duval is famous at least on. King Five's best Northwest destinations or escapes. Yeah. So well, that'll send them coming. I, I think. That, I think we put Duval on the map. It's, I, it's, they'll call me Duval Corridor. It's just hot right now. It is. It is from, hot. I, I, given that we're probably the most well-known, uh, you know, syndicated anything that comes out of the valley, we're probably partially responsible. I think so. Yeah. Right so. now, I think if we could just get a big flood, we could sell some waterfront property. Yeah. <laughs> Seasonal waterfront property. Seasonal waterfront property. Careful what you ask for, because you might get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, what are you doing there, Devin? Or, uh, Devin? Devin, you like combine our names? Yeah. Looks like he's cutting an apple with his pocket knife. Cutting an apple with my pocket knife. Did you sterilize that blade? I did, with river water. Oh, perfect. Mm Mm-hmm. Right on. That's a good Washington apple right there. Yeah, we're just selling Washington left and right here (laughs) on the show about Idaho today. Hey. Well, they have yeah. famous potatoes. We got famous apples. We actually make more potatoes than they do. Yeah, so. but don't tell anybody that. <laughs> They'll be very close to each other. Very it's close. like, just let them have that one thing. Let them have it. Besides Mr. Potato Head, name another famous potato. Uh, Baked potato. Hold That's on. It's a type. Uh, I'm not discriminating against types of potatoes. I, mean, I don't know. I don't know, Kirk. What's famous potato? Well, I, beyond Mr. Potato Head, I don't know. See, I, I think know, that I, they're I, taking I, I re- some liberties when they say famous potatoes. It's like <laughs> famous potato. <laughs> oh. Yeah. See, so you, you'd have Mr. Potato, Mrs. Potato. Well, that's yeah. kind of the same thing. Maybe. Okay. Famous potatoes, Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head. Right in. Tell us about the famous potatoes we're not thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on that note about writing in, uh, should we should we tell them what's going to happen if they write in when we might read it? Oh well, we're going to going to lay down our, our secret we've been keeping the last few shows. Yep, we're pulling the plug. We're done, right? Uh, no, we're not done. <laughs> the FCC so, has pulled the plug. There we go. Yeah. No. Uh, so in scheduling our our summer month shows, it was becoming apparent that uh, getting good guests over the summer month is an issue. Um, turns out that guides that guide. Uh, like to guide when their clients want to go fishing, which is during the summer. So, and it turns out one of our hosts is also a guide that likes to guide during the summer. So, uh, 
there were uh, scheduling conflicts pretty much with everything we were trying to do. And given that we want to keep the quality of the show, you know, mm. it's just superb. Oh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we, we didn't want to start cranking out a bunch of turds, essentially. <laughs> you can't force that. <laughs> no. Don't push too hard. Yeah. We didn't. You know, it, it just wasn't happening. Um, and given that this is our first year in business, we didn't really have a plan going into it. And it just seemed like summer is just not going to be the time to do the show. And so we're going to be taking a bit of a hiatus starting after this show. And by hiatus, I don't mean like we're done for the next three or four months. I mean, we're going to... Derek, don't eat into the microphone. I'm not. I can hear it. Anyway... Can we queue up some Don Hanley Boys of Summer right now? <laughs> I don't think we have the licensing to that. No. We, can, we could probably cover it. You want to sing it for us? Uh, pass. <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to do shows over the summer, but it's going to be pretty infrequent, and it's going to be ba- it's going to be on a basis of when we can get guests in. Yeah, it's not going to be okay. We're doing a show every week. Let's fill them up. Let's be okay. We got we got this going on. We got this guest that can do a show. Let's. Try and get a, find a time that the three of us can get in, make it happen, do a good show. If we can't do a good show, it's just not going to happen. No, so, I say we do bad shows if we can't do a good show. Yeah. Just give the people what they want, which is a show. <laughs> they just want something to download. Yeah. There's yeah. a term for that. It's called podcastus interruptus. Mm. Yeah. You just come up with that? I, well, it, you know, sometimes people suffer from that. So Yeah. So, um, it won't it be us. It'll be you. <laughs> yeah. We're, so we're, we're going to pick up regularly, regularly scheduled programming this fall. I don't have a, um, a specific date in mind yet. It's just going to kind of, it's going to kind of be when we can start regularly scheduling shows between the three of us and good guests. Like a back to school special. Yeah, exactly. And then yeah. through the through the fall and the winter months and the spring months, just like we did this year, not going to be a problem. I mean, there's still plenty of guests that we need to get on the show and, and do this. But summer's not the time to do it. And you guys should all be out spending time outdoors and enjoying your local fisheries besides sitting inside or in your cars listening to us. Well, just take it with you. I mean, it's portable, right? Get your iPhone. Yeah, but if you're listening iPad. to us when you're out fishing, you're not, you're not getting the... I, not, I think people like that. They like what? They like listening to us when they're out fishing. Oh. I think that's uh, that's a... F- Ooh, yeah. that, that's like on par with listening to us in the bedroom, <laughs> if you catch my drift. <laughs> Just crank that up. Turn off the Barry Manilow. Crank up the open fly. Your fly's open. Mm-hmm. Okay. Everybody that I talk to on the river that I fish with says, I really love that podcast. I listen to it while I'm on the river all the time. So... Oh. Maybe there's just a, a, an audience out there that you don't realize exists yet. Yet. Well, yeah. Derek knows they exist, apparently. I, I can tell you exactly where they are, too. Well, Derek, you were on board with not doing it over the summer, so now you're on board with doing it over the summer? No, 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 no. Okay, no, no. okay. That's okay. what I said. Okay. You know what happens when you assume? Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> well, then. Yeah. We've all seen that movie. Yeah. Yes. All right, so there you have it. Next couple months... Our flies will be open infrequently. Is, was, that's the, the long and short of it there. Huh. Anybody else? Good? Well, I got nothing. Don't have any grievances to air? I'm happy with that. No. Yeah, so Derek can, Derek can guide and, and work and not, not feel obligated to this, which is nice. I'm the only one that's sitting in here every day. It's a great source of material, however. So, mm-hmm. I mean, you can expect action-packed. Greasy, grimy, go for gut material when we get back in the fall. Yeah, well, we'll get some of that in, during the summer too. We're just going to wait till we have some. Yeah, during our hiatus, I'm going to take voice lessons too. Mm-hmm. I'm writing a I'm writing a script for a maybe to be released movie called the Open Flight Podcast dot com. Holy crap! So nice. just, just put nice. it out there. Who's gonna Who's gonna star you? Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. Yeah. Or Grant Show. <laughs> Martin Short for me. Yeah, that works. <laughs> I, I see what you did there. Yeah. Could we get I'm that? just going to go straight for Gary Busey. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why not? Uh, if he's still alive to play the part of Evan Byrne. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's still kicking. He was just in an Amazon commercial. Oh, I saw that. Get Charlie Sheen played by Busey representing you. <laughs> <laughs> he played Buddy Holly. I mean, he could... So, you know, he could, he could pull me off, I think. The world's full of imitations. Well, let's, let's not even talk about <laughs> Gary Busey pulling you off. <laughs> the world is full of imitations. So, yeah. 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 All right. So, yeah, we were going to try and do another show as our official, like, last show of the season. But it turned out 
we couldn't even schedule that because we were all pretty much, I think we're pretty, one of us is gone each week for like the next month. Like I'm, I'm in Mexico next week and Kirk is hiding out in a cabin the week after that. Derek is being important and guiding people the week after that. And you just can't get reliable help these days. No, no, you can't. But you know what? I, I might uh, put out some, some job listings on Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> see, see if I can find some, some interns to help me out over the summer. There we yeah, go. Yeah, there we go. Some studio interns. Yes. We should get an intern anyway. We should, we should. That would be great. A commu- <laughs> uh, recent communications graduate or soon to graduate. Send your resumes to the open fly podcast at gmail.com. Yeah. There's a lot of value in being first. Mm-hmm. So you could be you could be the first one to say that you were the open fly podcast intern. Yeah. Exactly. So we don't have to walk to the other end of the house to get our own coffee anymore. Don't misrepresent yourself. <laughs> Please send photos of you and fish and you have. You know, stuff like that, too. You have to have a resume. Yeah. I'm not saying we discriminate. We're an equal opportunity uh, employer and provider, but females will get preference. I'm fine with that. <laughs> Derek shaking his head. No, I don't have any problem with that at all. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah. So, so we're, we're 10 minutes into this, and we've gotten nowhere. That's part for the course. Or so, did you guys hear about somebody, quote, unquote, breaking into the local hatchery on the Snoqualmie? Oh, yes, up at the Tokel Creek. They, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. So those of you that know, yeah, we do talk a lot about our local waterways a lot, but a lot's going on, so we're going to continue to talk about them. You know, they uh, recently decided, or there was a ruling that the WDFW is not going to be releasing the Chambers Creek hatchery fish into the most Puget Sound rivers, except for the Skycomish. We talked about it a little bit last show. So that means that... Uh, Hatcheries like the Snoqualmie right here still had smolts that were unreleased, and they were going to be putting them on a truck and driving them, on, driving them across the state to put into a lake. And, you know, coincidentally, uh, somebody broke in, you know, some vigilante, somebody standing up for the rights of, you know, their rights to, you know, have hatchery fish, went in and released the fish into the river. And, you know, that's the official story, but I don't I don't know if I buy it. There's speculation that it was an inside job, too. Yeah, well, if, anybody that knows the way those places work, no, you, your every, average everyday angler is not going to climb the fence. I, I, th- I mean, those things are pretty well fortified, too. I don't think you can just get in there and get in there and release fish into the river. I don't think anybody's going to know how to do that. Yeah. And weren't they, like, on the truck already or something? I, I don't know. It's, a, it's fishy. The whole yeah. thing is it's fishy. yeah. yeah. Yeah, it basically you would have had to have been working there or had knowledge of the way the equipment worked in order to make that happen. You know, even even if it was somebody else that came in and did, it's almost like they left the key under the mat. Yeah. <laughs> well, this, isn't the Snoqualmie? Uh, didn't that get some special designation for they were going to try to get that back into a wild fish fishery? The Snow- well, that's, that's why they stopped the, the yeah in exactly. The first place? Yeah. I mean, that wouldn't have been my first choice for a wild. Not King wild river right. because just just because of the lack of uh, habitat, the lack of habitat, you know, because you've only got like three major spawning tribs and they're not really affected too much by the hatchery fish. But was it twenty five thousand smolt? Yeah, when usually they release like one hundred fifty thousand. So right. So you know, in in a couple of years, you're going to have a good return of about five fish. Yeah, I think the the return is like point zero seven. Yeah. Percent. Do we <laughs> well, know were these smolts had they been clipped already? I don't know that much, actually. That wasn't in the official reports. So here's my experience on that river. So what was going to happen is that, you know, it opens up on June 1st. Come middle of July, those fish are going to be about six to seven inches long. Mm -hmm. And you can catch them on dry flies all day long. And we're not saying we're not advocating, you know, keeping over your limit. But (laughs) we're not advocating that. Right. We're not advocating going out and, and catching a whole bunch of hatchery smolts. And and giving them a rough release, we we'd absolutely never tell any, anybody to do no, that. No. But I might have some spots on my drift boat available. <laughs> <laughs> but if they weren't clipped, that that could be problematic. In yeah, that, that endeavor clipped. that we're definitely telling you not to do. No, there's other ways that you can tell. Yeah, that's true. But cross-eyed, the, yeah, they're a little bit cross-eyed and a little dumb. But <laughs> but yeah, the the point being that the, those are, there's a lot. Those are fish that probably aren't going to make it a couple of months. They're going to be eaten up by the bigger resident fish that are in there and. 25,000 little smolts in the Snoqualmie, it, it's more of a symbolic thing. It's not yeah. really going to af- affect the, no, the, it's really the ecosystem in the river at all. It's just a, someone giving mm-hmm. the wild fish advocates a big finger and saying, huh. Huh. Yeah. Word. Word. So, That's my yeah, just uh, another, another thing happening right in our own backyard. Mm. 
For those of you that don't know, that is the river that the Open Fly Studios, aka the Sharts Shark Shack, uh, is uh, is located upon. Mm-hmm. You can almost see it from here. Yeah. You can almost see the Shark Shack from here. No, oh, the river. Like, the river. Oh. <laughs> All right. How, how about we let one of our listeners win something? That sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah our, our monthly winning things. Which listener? Uh, the one that we, the one that gets drawn. So even, and, and I want to do, I do want to add that over the, the coming months, over the summer months, even though we're doing irregular shows, uh, we're still going to be doing giveaways. So those of you that are donating, if you suspend your donations over the summer, I mean, you know, we fully understand, but if you do continue donating, your chances of winning are going to be even better. We're still going to give away prizes. That's not stopping or it'll probably still be at least once a month. You'll win things. Um, yeah. So don't stop donating. We do still have our, our expenses are not going down. We still have the same hosting uh, and the same, you know, the same site hosting, same file hosting, all that still costing us money. So that's what you're stuck. Yep. So give us money while we're not on the air. Yeah. Yep. Good. It's like a subsidy. <laughs> yeah. We'd like to get paid. That's pretty to much not what it is. Produce a podcast. I mean, none of us are getting paid. It's it's conservation. Dividends. So really, what we're doing is we're just showing people how you can use things that already exist for your current needs. Right. Upcycling. Mm-hmm. Upcycling. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I like that. Let's find a winner. Random generator. Hold on. Of course, it's all closed. Throw a little bit of one of those spring twangs in there, Kurt, that you do pretty well. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher this last name, but Peter Legreed, Legreed, Legrid, Legrid, Peter Legrid, Legrid. You know what you win? Uh, so it's gonna be officially the the prize is an Allen XLA series reel. Uh, but if, if that's a reel that you're not going to be able to make use of, I know it's kind of a big game reel, but if you're, you know, a mountain brook trout fisherman, it'd be pretty much useless for you because it's like bigger than the fish you're catching. Uh, if, it, if that's not going to work out for you, we'll work out something else. So, Peter, send me an email, theopenflypodcast at gmail.com, and we will get that sent out to you. Congratulations. Yay. Very nice. Yeah. Yay, Peter. Thanks for donating stuff. Yeehaw. All right. Okay, Moving does on. that wrap things up for the day? Yeah. Kirk, I'm going to cue up your theme song, because guess what? We have feedback this week. Hey. I have job security. Yes. Thank Everybody, thank you for supporting Kirk's employment with the Open Fly podcast. Yep. We'll double his salary for the show. Perfect. Okay, first, Kristoff writes in, does Evan have what it takes, was my first thought, but after powering through seven episodes in one day... I find myself really looking forward to the next episodes. Keep up the great content and interviews. I might suggest you contact Alexandra Morton, a privately funded salmon conservation researcher in B.C., currently investigating the effects of salmon farming and their contribution to the spread of infectious salmon anemia virus. Given that farmed salmon are sold countrywide, this is an issue that is relevant to all of North America. Her blog is located here. I'll skip the HTTP colon <laughs> forward slash forward slash. Yeah, just skip that part. Yeah. <laughs> Alexandra Morton dot typepad dot com forward slash. Keep it open. Keep it wet. Oh. All right. Was yeah. That, was that Christoph with a K or a C? Let's see. It's C and an H. So it's Whoa, like Christoph. Christopher. Christoph. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I know Christoph. He's a friend of mine. Yeah, I met him last fall. But he just moved. He le- he, he left us. Oh, did he go to Georgia or something like that? No, he went to Alaska. Oh. So no. I don't feel bad for him then. No, because now I have a home base where I can I can use my miles that I accumulate, you know, over the year traveling for work, and then I can go fly to Alaska for more quote unquote work. There you go. Yeah. Field research. Gas up the anyway. Jet. Yeah. And enough about Christoph. Uh, yeah, Alexander Morton is actually somebody I'd really like to get on the show. I haven't. I haven't tried to reach out to her uh, to get her on the show, but I I think she fits in exactly with what we're doing here. She's probably undoubtedly listening, so get a Mm -hmm. hold of us, Alexandra, please. Yeah. So, yeah. How does she do that? How does she do what? How does she get a hold of us? (laughs) Oh, email. Uh, Carrier pigeon. Which is? Theopenflypodcast at gmail.com. There you go. Or our contact page at theopenflypodcast. You have to tell people these things or else they just don't figure it out. Yeah, it's true. I'm sorry. Yeah, Theopenflypodcast.com. Click on the contact link, and you will be sent to a forum that will send us an email automatically. In fact, Christoph just it would actually use that. That's so. how he did it. So we That's know how that it he works. Did it. We yeah. know that it works. Or maybe just contact Christoph, and he'll tell you how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So, yeah, Alexandra, definitely on our on our wish list. 
Uh, we haven't officially reached out to her to, to get an answer, but we haven't been turned down yet. So there you go. We're, we're, we're batting a thousand as far as getting, you know, there, there's a couple places that never responded, but nobody's actually told us no. <laughs> yeah, that's a good track record. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like the girls at the high school dance that just, you ask them if they'd like to dance and they just turn around and walk away. Yeah. They yeah, didn't you didn't get no. no. They didn't say no. That's a new just, dance style. I, I just do just tell myself. Oh, the music's too loud. She probably didn't hear me. Could be. Mm-hmm. Okay, next, Patrick writes in, gentlemen of the open fly. While listening to your latest podcast during my morning constitutional, <laughs> though I may have misheard, I thought there was a mention of the stickleback. <laughs> <laughs> Not the Nickelback, the Stickleback. Not the stick. Yeah, he must have just been half listening during his constitutional. Yeah. <laughs> there must have been a fish tank in that orthodontist's office that Derek was visiting. And I'm not surprised that a guide of his obvious of his obvious talent could listen to a stickleback. After all, I believe he may be a trout whisperer. <laughs> oh. I had a random contact with a stickleback or two years ago when I was a kid, and the only fly I used was attached via monofilament to a clear bobber that was cast with a spinning rod. These sticklebacks were in California's June Lake, and I was swimming among them. They were inoffensive fish, and I do not believe it is fair to refer to any stickleback as a hoser, whether it lives in Canada or elsewhere. As essentially, it is a bait fish and important to many ecosystems. Mm -hmm. If you're going after the bigger trouts or basses, sticklebacks do matter. May your rods always be bent. Patrick, P.S. With all the mentions of slick bottoms and boobies in this (laughs) podcast, I'm wondering if my visits to Washington have been during the wrong seasons or in the wrong places. Yes. (laughs) I can tell that he took a lot of time to write that. There's There's some caring in that email. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, reminds me of the, proof, it, the proofs in the pudding. Sarah Henry was swinging a stickleback pattern, and she caught the only fish yeah. of the day. And for those that don't know, Sarah Henry is a, a Canadian friend of ours that lives pretty close to Nickelback, which rhymes with stickleback. Right. So, and she was swinging a stickleback and caught a trout while Derek was guiding her. Perfect. Yeah, the, just everything. Everything. It, it's all related. It all connects. I wouldn't have had her using a stickleback pattern if I didn't know that sticklebacks weren't the bait food of the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As far as the slick bottoms and boobies, uh, can't help you. Yeah. That's just, you, you got to find your own way. I wonder how uh, Patrick feels about chubs. <laughs> Good ask. Patrick, let us know your feelings on chubs. Yeah, or squaws. Squ- hey, this squawfish. is a politically correct show. Right. Yeah, squawfish. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, thanks for that effort, Patrick. Okay. I hope that your morning constitutional <laughs> worked out well for you. <laughs> it's a big one. You sit up off the seat. You don't want to get splashed. <laughs> Brian writes in, Hi, gents. Great job on the podcast. Came to the game late and ended up blowing through all of them in a few days. It's helped my perspective in the hatcheries around the Portland area. Any way you can get David James Duncan on the podcast? I'm sure there's a way. David James Duncan? Yeah, author of River Y. Jeez, you know everything. No, just that. Mm. (laughs) Uh, Great author and a passionate guy on the conservation front. Quack, rye whiskey, and not a Canadian. Well, thanks for that. Yeah. No, I think David James Duncan would probably be a great interview. It would be. Yeah. So we'll get a show of him and Alexander Morton next fall. Perfect. Oh. Come back for that one, It's y'all. already done. Yeah. That, yeah. that would be a pretty good show, actually. It would be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, I think that, that, that summarizes our opening, <laughs> our opening drivel. It only took, what, a half hour to say very little? Uh, 20-something minutes. Yeah, Yeah, close enough. All right, well, we're going to get going to our first break here, unless anybody else has something to add. No. 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 All right, you can go to our website at www.theopenflypodcast.com where you can buy shirts and stickers, and you can click on the Donate button. Any of those things, if you buy a shirt, buy a sticker, click the Donate button, you'll be entered into our monthly raffle. And any and all of that money will go to... Keep our lights on, and it'll go to the conservation cars, causes that we bring onto the show. So I need to get a new shirt, by the way. Oh, uh, tell us why you need a shirt. I gave you a new one a you couple did. weeks ago. You did, and I was treating it almost like a dress shirt, wearing it just for special occasions. <laughs> and then uh, I got sidetracked. I was in the garage 
um, caulking the seams on my boat trailer, mm-hmm. laying on my back doing so, not knowing that there were a few blobs of caulk on the floor of the garage that I laid in. So you just got caulk all over your back? I did. <laughs> That's unfortunate. <laughs> it is. You delivered that pretty well. Were you, were you not applying the slick bottom coating? I was just caulking the seams to keep the rust from weeping. Mm. So next time you should apply the slick bottom coating and you will, and you will not get caulk all over your back. Oh, I see what I just wa- I just walked into that. Damn it. Let's go to that break now. Not Air- that there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. If slick bottoms are more your thing, airboatcoatings.com, our sponsor's Wetlander, would love to hear from you. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. This is what you signed up for. <laughs> All right. Uh, I guess that about sums up. We told people to go to our website. You can also find us on Facebook, the Instagrams. I think Twitter. Do we still Twitter? Oh yeah. Cause, oh yeah. We, cause we I get it. Right along. Yeah, Tweet. and we we do the Googler, the Googler Plus, and uh, you know if it's a social network, we probably have some kind of presence there. So come follow us. Click like. You know that that really validates what we're doing. Share share what we share with you. Yeah, re- retweet and favorite our tweets. Yeah. See, I'm I'm learning. You are. I I actually understand that about Twitter now. Perfect. Yep. You've Good. been enlightened. Yay. Ooh, I like there, that. Yeah, that's just becoming your new, your new thing, just plucking the, the springs on your mic stand. It's my zen spring. It's very zen. Yes. What does the other one sound like, the, the top arm? So a little higher pitch? It's got a little more vibration. Yeah. So right. I do the low one now? They're, at, they're, they're not in the same key. Yeah, maybe they are. Not the low one. Is that in the top one? This, the top one's actually a lower key, but there's more vibration because okay, the spring so isn't as go. All right, we're going to go to break. Go we'll be back in go just a moment after this top, word from our sponsors. Top, 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 top. All right, bye. This is Derek, and on behalf of Stream Tech Boats, I want to talk to you about three factors that I consider really important when you're choosing a drift boat, and that's safety, fun, and performance. These are the safest drift boats around to float out of. They're fun to row, and from a performance standpoint, if you're a professional on the water, all three of these factors are important. So let's take a second to hear from the man who designed the boat himself. I tried pretty much everything, but just none of them were really doing what I wanted. So we set out to design a boat. I'd call it the one, the one boat that would maneuver like the hard boats, that would go in the really rough places, that would float high, that would have all the amenities that come on a hard boat with anchor systems and good leaning, a very nice flat floor that you can inflate hard, that you can stand on, no bolts, no nuts, no pins, no clips, nothing to put it together. The reasons that it's so good for fishing, it's got this rocker and so it pivots quickly and it slides out on the foam pile when you come off big drops. That rocker just climbs right out on the foam pile. A total game changer. So there you have it. My recommendation, Link's words. Look for us at www.streamtechboats.com. Call Link directly. He'll answer that phone and he'll get you on your way towards the best drift boat on the market. Now back to the open fly. All right, we're back with today's conservation segment. Today's conservation segment is brought to you by Wetlander, the slick boat bottom coating. And, you know, despite our, our joking around about it in the last segment, uh, this stuff is the real deal. I uh, coated my boat top to bottom, my aluminum drift boat. Uh, it is the slickest, most flexible boat bottom coating on the market. And I can say that from experience from having used the other ones on the market. And that is why we accepted them on as a sponsor, because it's something that I truly believe in and would be more than happy to recommend to anybody. So if you have any questions about it, you can get a hold of me, the open fly podcast at gmail.com and ask my personal opinion, or you can go straight to airboatcoatings.com. And Scott Hogan, the the guy that that's behind it, he will talk to you, make sure it's right for your boat, whether it's a fiberglass, aluminum, or any other kind of drift boat or, or anything else you might have, you'd be surprised the, the, the different uses that it can be used for. So uh, get a hold of me, get a hold of Scott, anybody. Uh, we'll make sure that it's right for you and get it on your boat. So airboatcoatings.com, wetlander. All right, and today's conservation segment is going to be with the Henry's Fork Foundation. We got, um, hold on a sec. <laughs> 
Brandon Hoffner. Sorry, I forgot his last name there for a second. Way to go, Evan. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're, we're real journalists over here. I was like, Brandon... Yeah, Brandon Hoffner. Sorry, Brandon. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> no problem. Brandon is the uh, executive director there at the Henry's Fork Foundation and uh, is going to tell us a little bit about what they're doing. And uh, like usual, we're going to hopefully relate it to what's going on in on your local waterways and, and all that. So, um, Brandon, welcome aboard. Well, thank you for having me today. I appreciate it. You are very welcome. Um, today's kind of our, our Idaho spotlight show, so Henry's Fork Foundation seemed uh, like a perfect fit, and uh, that was Kirk's idea. He doesn't have very many good ideas, but I think this is one of them. Actually, I do. You do? And I'm I'm credited with having several good ideas. Oh, that's right. We got feedback that one day that yeah. said that. So, Kirk, thanks for thanks for coming up with this one. Then. I think it's a good idea because I'm going to be on the Henry's Fork later this summer, and I'm looking forward to it. Well, the impetus, it, so. the impetus was that last September I was over in Victor, Idaho, and we drove up to Island Park and fished uh, the canyon and uh, one stretch of the ranch. Um, I'd always wanted to, to visit the Henry's Fork, and being there made me realize that it's, it's a destination fishery for people from all over. Yeah. And so the Henry's Fork Foundation is obvious an organization doing work on a fishery that gets an amazing amount of pressure. So um, I think this will be a great interest to people from far and wide. Yeah. All right. Uh, so why don't you go ahead and, uh, Brandon, tell us a little bit about the Henry's Fork uh, Foundation, what you guys do, maybe a little bit about the history, and then we'll we'll go from there. Okay, but well, there was one comment that I should probably follow up on, and it's it's pretty amazing that uh, as staff of the Henry's Fork Foundation, we can go to Asheville, North Carolina, we can go all around the United States, and you know it has a following in Japan. And you tell you walk into a shop somewhere, and you tell them about you're from the Henry's Fork Foundation, and they know exactly what you're talking about, and and the river and the story, you know, by and large. And we have donors ac- across the nation, and, it, and actually a reach that. I was surprised to find when I arrived here three years ago for a local watershed group, and, and that really plays into the fact that it is a, a nationally known fishery where people come from all over, and you know, they, they plan their year around their trip to the Henry's Fork. So that's that's definitely the truth there. Um, you know, we a little bit about our history. It you know, started in 1984. This is our 30th anniversary, so it's a big deal for us uh, here in 2014. I also started in 1984. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and we determined before we got on this call that we were more mature than you. So I, I, yeah, <laughs> and that I, I can, yeah, given that Henry's Fork and I both share the same birthday, I think Henry's Fork Foundation, um, yeah, definitely wins the maturity award here. It's doing better work as well. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Carry on. Well, well, going back to that time uh, in 1984, there was a, a couple topics that uh, had great concern for the anglers that, that loved the Henry's Fork, and, and they were uh, – Essentially, the banks of the Henry's Fork were falling apart due to a long history of cattle grazing both in Harriman State Park and on the, the National Forest lands. And uh, they decided that fencing the cattle out would be a good uh, a good deal, and they needed a foundation to help them do that. So that was one of the projects. Uh, the other was the proposed hydropower facilities on uh, at Mesa Falls on the Henry's Fork. And so you had uh, you know Mike Lawson and, and other folks going back to Washington D.C. and and uh, talking to Congress about those issues and, and uh, essentially made sure that, that that didn't happen, had legislative tours here on the Henry's Fork, and really that got the, the foundation started. Uh, up until 1992, there was no staff. It was fully run out of uh, Dr. Mick Nicholson's office in Pocatello, Idaho, and he kind of bankrolled the operation uh, from a volunteer standpoint. And uh, then in 92, they hired the first executive director and started to hire, you know, uh, Ecologists, hydrologists, and you know, there's been a different mix of staff here. Um, you know, right now we have uh, a senior scientist and, and uh, a staff of research and restoration folks, and then also a fundraising staff. So, it, it's been a uh, you know, I think quite a ride for the Henry's Fork Foundation. A lot of different uh, issues that we've dealt with, uh, looking at uh, you know, going back to the late '70s, the the Henry's Fork was a, a stocked fishery, and then in the early '80s that stopped. And, and now we can proudly say that uh, through some of our work and the research that led to different projects. Uh, we now have a wild trout fishery that the, at least the population index in Box Canyon and some of these areas um, below Island Park uh, suggest that we have as many fish in the river that are wild fish as we did when it was stocked. So I think that's a real accomplishment for the foundation and all of our supporters. That's that's pretty good numbers. You do a fair amount of education uh, locally, don't you? Yeah, yeah. When, you know, we have this... Uh, 
uh, this world famous watershed, then the interesting thing is, you know, 6,200 fish per mile in Box Canyon and, and other sections doing really well. Um, but our, a lot of our local population, they they don't realize what they have in their backyard. Um, they live, work here. They've their family's been here four generations, and, and as far as that perspective, they don't know much about it. How it is such a unique uh, ecological area and these different. Uh, you know, one of the most ecologically diverse uh, sites in the United States, you know, being that we have, uh, you know, the, the moisture we get here, if you look at a map and, and you look at uh, annual precipitation, this, this part of Idaho, Wyoming, Montana here stands out. We just, we have such a, a diverse ecosystem because of that, uh, that moisture that most places just don't get in the West. And, and the, you know, of course, just like a lot of places, quick turnaround from dry to wet but uh, we're fortunate. I'm sure we get more moisture here in Duval <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That, that is true. and we do not have 6200 fish per mile <laughs> actually I think we got 25,000 fish per mile at the, the top of the Snoqualmie there right now well, I don't know if you heard about that you if you listen to the show today you'll hear all about that but I'll have to somebody that. somebody broke into the hatchery quote unquote and dumped in a bunch of steelhead smolts that weren't supposed to be there so oh anyway carry on some bucket biology almost there then. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, that's that's the official story. But if, if you listen to the sh- uh, to the show today, you'll you'll hear that we think there's more to the story. But carry on. Okay. Well, we we do have so we have a pretty good uh, outreach program then, and and we have one of our staff that spends time in our fifth grade uh, classes here in, in Ashton, Idaho, and they go through the Troughton classroom program, which is. Is a nationwide program, but it really gets uh, specialized to the Henry's Fork here, and, and uh, it's been a great outreach for us because it, it connects families in our community to what we're doing, and, and uh, lets them. You know, we'll probably get a little bit more into this or have a chance to. That you know, the way we operate, we we try to work very collaboratively uh, with the irrigators, the agriculture interests, the other people that use water in the basin. I mean, the Henry's Fork has to also help uh, irrigate 2.1 million acres in in southern Idaho. So it's a working river, um, and and the, the the amount of research we have to do on surface water, groundwater interaction here, and, and looking at how our river now functions versus how it may have functioned, you know, prior to settlement. You know, those are, those are two completely different systems now, and but yet it's still very healthy, and and we want to educate people on on uh, how we work with folks and able able to work within the framework that uh, exists here under state law and so forth. Hey, Brandon, this is Derek. I've got a question for you about um, you described that it was a hatchery fishery or a, a planted fishery before, and now it's a wild fishery, and that's a, a big change. And we have those issues here in Washington where you've got the conflicts between, you know, those two opposing parties. How did you or how did the foundation get to that core in people where they started to appreciate the wild fish more than what was there prior. And it, I mean, can you describe how you made that shift and some people started to care more about the wild fish than the, the, the plants? Well, um, you know, I think the interesting part, interesting thing about that is that, uh, you know, it, it was difficult early on. It wasn't an easy um, switch over. And there was, a, you know, disgruntled folks. And, and uh, you look into the late 80s and people were upset that the fishing wasn't as good as the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, you know, as far as a, a 15 or 16 inch planter, and, and I'm getting all of this secondhand. You know, I can only relate what I've heard from folks that have been here a long time. But uh, then in 1992, we had a, a sediment dump out of Island Park Reservoir, and at that time, you would have, uh, you know, the, the ranch and a lot of those sections down there were inundated with sediment, and, and there was another kind of renewed. Well, we need planted, you know, a planted fishery here, and what happened during that reservoir dump is some of the fish did end up down in in the henry's fork and so you had you had this uh, uh artificial fishery again where we had terrible sediment problems um but we also had great fishing because all of those reserv- reservoir fish that ended up in the river and so it took many years uh but i think people now see that uh after having success with wild fish and uh, the way they behave the way they <clears throat> The way they act towards the fly and, and the, just the nature of it. Uh, we did some branding studies uh, for about well, three, four years ago, and literally we're down to where only 10 or 15% of the people still favor stocking in, in any manner. Most people here want to come to this river and fish for wild fish, and they've just developed that mindset that fishing for large wild fish on the ranch and, uh, you know, even 10 years ago, uh, five years ago, if you didn't see as many, that was fine. Now we actually get complaints. Well, there's too many of those fat 16-inch fish in the river. I know it's just part of having a, a healthy age structure. Um, it, 
you know, we can't keep those off our line. And, well, that's a good problem to have. Now, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> healthy, fat, wild fish in the river. So. Oh, no, a 16-inch fish. The, uh, the sediment dump that occurred in 92, um, is that an event that could have been avoided? Well, yeah, and then that was actually um, the Henry Sport Watershed Council. We co-facilitate that with Fremont Madison Irrigation District. Um, kind of was born out of that uh that issue and a couple other issues. Uh, actually, that was an Idaho fish and game trying to clean up the fish assemblage in Island Park Reservoir you know, as far as rough fish, and they wanted to rote known, and, and it just got taken a little too far, and, and it wasn't monitored closely. It, it's hard to imagine it happening now uh, just because of the collaboration and communication between the federal state agencies, uh, groups like ours. We just, you know, we meet quite often. We're always talking about different issues on the river. Uh, when there's going to be a project, we work through a process of looking at and evaluating those projects together. So it, it wouldn't happen now more than likely. I hate to say never, um, but it did, it did start a, uh, a, a tradition now of communication that has turned out to be really positive for the river. Right. And, and uh, you know, you talk to the old timers on the river, and, and they went out there, and you know, a feeling you can read some. I think it was maybe in Fly Fisherman, Mike Lawson Road, and this feeling of death. And Renee Harrop and these guys, oh, this is awful. Well, it, it, luckily we have these resilient systems too. That given a little time and a little energy, uh, luckily we had a you know a flood three or four years later that helped flush a lot of that out. And, you know, high flows. I wouldn't say flood, I guess, but high flows, uh, natural high flows that cleaned it back out and, and, and things are different still today but yet it's a very you know it's very productive right we're, we're the today's show is about um you know places that were secret at one point and um are now suffering for it but it seems like the henry's fork has gone an entirely different direction i mean all those fish per mile that's an amazing number of fish and that obviously has to attract a lot of attention so how has that has that changed the fishery at all, or has that be, is it the factor that the more people know about it, the more they want to protect it? We're going to, we're exploring that quite a bit today on the show. Okay, well, that, you know, that, it's a great point. We actually look at a at a membership in the Henry Support Foundation. A lot of people look at it when they come here. They're kind of buying into it. Now I've got a stake in the Henry Support, and, and luckily with those types of population uh, that we have in different sections of the river, and you you look at 80 miles of, of fishable water. It can handle a lot of pressure. Now, there's always going to be issues with, you know, too many boats at certain times or too many people on the water, and people will get a little bent out of shape. They'll yearn for some olden time when, you know, or times past when there may not have been someone. Uh, but normally you can go find a spot and, and have yourself a pretty good day of fishing, even with uh, the, the attention paid to the Henry's Fork. And, you know, in 2011 we had, a, you know, super high water year, and the South Fork and the Madison and all Teton and all these surrounding rivers were blown out and stayed blown out most of the year, uh, and, and all the pressure was on the Henry's Fork. And if it wouldn't have been for the Henry's Fork, there wouldn't have been a lot of fishing to be had uh, around here. So we see that as a, a great resource to have, this you know, uh, a spring-fed type system that, that in certain years can be the only game in, in town, and uh, we're kind of proud of that. And I think if we work hard and work with the people that come here and, and want to donate and help us with our work, uh, it'll be able to handle that pressure going forward. Mm -hmm. It seems like Mm -hmm. Idaho is quite blessed with, you know, good fisheries. And we're, you know, we're all, you know, that's, that's the reason why we're having the show today is to talk about the the good and, and the good and the bad and figure out why, what you're doing differently that other states and other organizations um, can start to model. So, you know, hats off to you. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, well, thanks. Yeah. You got to have the good, the good starting ground to begin with that goes back to that moisture we get here and this you know, the moisture plume that ends up here and and the geology that allows for a, a spring fed system of water that percolates through the, the Madison plateau and yellowstone national park and ends up in big springs and flows into the henry's fork or or the other systems we have too just, we just have a a lot of water to begin with overall compared to a lot of places and and then these collaborative efforts where we get it's not always pretty we don't always agree um you know, we do get criticism. Why would you talk to the irrigators? Uh, but they really do. You know, they. We've got a, a huge agriculture economy here, and and the, the people on our staff and our board. We want to figure out how to make the, the fishing and the fishing industry and the health of our rivers additive to that. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, got a lot of potatoes that need watering. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Who uh, who was Henry? 
that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, back We're to, full of good questions today. <laughs> you know, I, I don't even know which Henry it was. There's there's Henry's Fort. There's Henry's uh, Fork. Uh, you know, it's also called the North Fork of the Snake River. And uh, so I, I don't even know who Henry is, to be honest. Is I guess it Henry I Winkler? That. that was not a question I had prepared myself for. <laughs> well, we, we can bleep this out and make you sound intelligent. <laughs> I'm going with Henry VIII. Uh, I'm Henry, saying Henry Winkler. Henry, Henry Ford. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, no, we don't need to make me sound intelligent. <laughs> I would worry about bleeping it out. It's probably that Caribbean Canadian. Oh, Dave oh, Henry. I know who it is. I know who it is. Dave Henry. Dave Henry. The Canadian. Named after Dave Henry. <laughs> the Caribbean. Sorry, you, uh, sorry, Brian. You probably don't know who that is. He's he's a friend of ours. He's a Canadian, so it makes sense. They named it after a it Canadian. Yeah, there we <laughs> go. <laughs> Dave Henry's Fork of the Snake River. <laughs> so, where are the offices of the foundation located? You're in Ashton. Yeah, we're right on downtown Ashton here on Main Street, uh, 512 Main Street in Ashton. We actually have a building that was donated by one of our uh, supporters, and, and so we've got uh, our staff of eight that uh, offices right here in Ashton. And then during the summer, we try to have a satellite office in the Island Park area. Nice. So people can stop in and talk to us while they're, you know, they can come from Trout Hunter or Henny's Fork Anglers or wherever else and stop by and visit us. What are uh, what are the, your, your forecasts for fishing conditions at the end of June this year? I'm coming out. I'll stop by the office and say hi, bring you a shirt or something. That'd be fantastic. Um, you know, the, the fishing conditions this year should be great. Um, we're still riding the wave of high water. You know, some of the 6,200 fish per mile, um, it's a result of not only drought management planning, which is an effort where we work with the federal, state, and then local agencies uh, to ensure that we, we're not trying to get more water, but we're trying to do is shape flows so that they're beneficial to the trout population. So we're looking at juvenile survival in, in Box Canyon and some of these areas. Um, so we shape those flows, uh, but it always helps when we have more water. We can, we can do it. That's a much easier job when there's uh, more snowpack. So we're still reaping the words of a couple years of, of high water. Also in that is that uh, a tributary to the Henry's Fork, in 2005-06, uh, we put in a functioning fish ladder on the Buffalo River at the Buffalo Hydro facility. And uh, we're now doing a lot of research. Uh, you know, this last year we estimated there was 4,000 fish that came out of the Buffalo tributary into the Henry's Fork. And so we're starting to see the... the uh, culmination a lot of effort uh you know the the fish ladder was part of a, a FERC process a lot of negotiations about that fish ladder and how to pay for it and make it happen uh future monitoring of it we were able to do that back you know early in the 2000s and then the same with the drought management planning our prior research had said we have to have water at certain times we can go with a little lower fall flow uh fill the reservoir a little earlier um then look for critical cold periods in the winter, raise the flow as necessary, drop it down when it's maybe a little warmer and wetter. Uh, you know, as an example, this year we had uh, you know, December 3rd. It turned real cold and nasty, you know, below zero type weather. And that was the same day we had kind of forecast, and we went ahead and cranked the river up a little bit. We were able to leave the, the flows up until the middle of January. And while it was still cool, it wasn't as cold. And uh, by the time we got to February, it was warm and wet, and we could – turn the flows down a little bit more and store the water the irrigators needed and, and meet the needs of the fish at the same time. Question. Uh, so you're talking about fish ladders and all that. It made me uh, think, is the, the Henry's Fork, is it above an anadromous barrier? Do you get any anadromous fish or are they cut off from that part of the no, system? You've got Shoshone Falls and, you know, uh, all of that down below us. Okay, so there's like a natural um, barrier. Yeah, we don't there. have okay. the anadromous fish. You know, you go of course, not far into central Idaho, and that changes immediately and so forth. But here, we don't have that. But back mm -hmm. to the, should the fishing be good? We're riding this wave of all the success right now, and, and uh, we're waiting on the current uh, population index from Idaho Fish and Game. Uh, they were just out with some of our staff last week uh, doing some of that work. They'll finish up next week, and we'll have a, a population estimate by the end of this month. But we expect it to be really strong again, um, hopefully that 6,200 fish per mile or even above. And uh, there should be lots of 15 to 20 inch fish in the river in late June, and and the weather, the flows are looking good. You know, we can be affected by flows headed down for irrigation. We had some high water last summer, or higher water uh, due to water rights accounting and having to send water out of our reservoirs down to you know near Twin Falls, Idaho, South Central Idaho, uh, which affected the fishing a little bit. It was hot too, but this year we're looking at. at the, the right flows, you know, 1,100, 1,200, 1,300 CFS, and, 
and uh, and if it doesn't get too hot, it should be fish, fishing should be good through the whole summer. Nice, cool. Uh, all right, uh, Brandon, we're running out of time here, but um, we'll get a few more questions out of here. Uh, for one, if if somebody's thinking about they want to check out the Henry's Fork, you got any advice for a first timer to get out there where to where to look or how to how to go about slaying hogs? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, one of the best ways, of course, is you know we've got. Uh, Trout Hunter, we've got uh, Henry's Fork Anglers, Three Rivers Ranch, all these great outfitters. You know, you can go spend a day with those, one of those guys from one of those shops. Uh, you know, World Cast Anglers, uh, Teton Valley Lodge. You go out with any of those guides, and they they know the river pretty well, and and I think that's a great way to start. Um, you know, if they want to come in and visit with us, they can, and and we'd be more than happy to talk to them. But we probably don't always have the best information. We're we're too busy doing our work to always get out fishing, although we we try. Um, so yeah, I would I would start there and and uh, spend a day with a guide and and learn a little bit about the river and go from there. But it, it it's a uh, it's a challenging river. That's the other thing about it. There's you go to fish the ranch and that's not a an easy day of fishing. If you some of the best fishermen I know, if they come off that and have caught a, a couple of nice fish, it's a fantastic day. I'll uh, I'll confirm that it is not easy. <laughs> <laughs> We actually got chased off a stretch of the river down in the ranch by a thunderstorm, which basically just uh, sh- basically cut our losses short. I, kind of the way I put it. <laughs> well, we went out to that film short thing again. <laughs> <laughs> we we went out to film our 30th anniversary film last September, and we had some like I said, some of the best fishermen in this area, well-renowned authors and everything else, and and. Uh, our conservation fund director was the only one that caught a fish, and it was an eight-inch rainbow. And it was just, how could this happen with these? You're not selling it anymore. <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to tell you what it's not. It is not. You have to go to Warm River or you know Stonebridge to Ashton. That's where you go if you need a little easier time catching fish. If you when you want a challenge, you go to the ranch. Awesome. So. If our listeners want to contribute, find out more about what you're doing or, or anything like that, uh, where can they find out more information? They can definitely go to www.henrysfork.org. Henrysfork.org. Yeah, Perfect. Henrysfork.org, and that will have membership information, a lot of information about the work we do, uh, phone numbers. They can call us and talk to us. Uh, we love to have people stop by the office and, or give us calls and talk to us about the work we're doing. Awesome. Any of you guys have any more questions that you want to ask Brandon before we cut him loose? No. Uh, great job. I mean, obviously you're you're doing a wonderful job of protecting a, a nugget that you have over there, and uh, it's, it's impressive that a river that gets that much attention can continue to give give back the results that it does, and that's obviously due in no small part to to your organization. Yeah, 3,000 members, a lot of support that we get to make that happen, that's for sure. And I sure appreciate the chance to come on and visit with you guys today. No, thanks for coming on. Dude. We appreciate you not rejecting our offer for airtime. <laughs> yeah. We're, like I so said, before we brought you on, we're batting 1,000 right now. We've had, we've had a few non-responses, but everybody that's responded has responded favorably. <laughs> Good deal. Yeah. Cool. All right, Brandon, thanks a lot for coming on board. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Talk to you later. All right, yeah. take care. Bye-bye. So we can encourage our listeners to go to henrysfork.org and donate and send their receipts to us? Yes, that is correct. What happens if they do that? They win things. Cool. Well, they have a chance at winning things. Mm. Right on. Yeah. I'll be out there at the uh, end of June, so if you see me in my Dream Tech boat salmon fly. Do that, do that stretch that he mentioned. The, the, hard, the hard one or the easy the one? The confidence-boosting stretch. Well, we're doing 65 or 70 miles over the course of like three or four days. So, That's it? Yeah. Nice. We're doing Swan Valley down, so... Yeah. I have I have never been there. How far is it from Boise? About a four hour drive. Oh, okay, never mind. Because yeah. I'll be in Boise this fall, but that's that's a ways. Well, there's Bo- good places Boise. In Boise. There's no Z in Boise. Oh, sorry. There's I'll good, be in Boise. There's good places in Boise to go fishing. Yeah, I'll, I'll have a mic from Cutthroat Leaders to. Oh yeah, you'll you'll be fine, yeah. dude. <laughs> I was gonna I was gonna see if I could book a day with Hank Patterson, but I haven't gotten a hold of him yet. Um, he might already be booked. Bring PBRs. Yeah. Yeah, the Henry Fork is a, it's a beautiful area, and we actually did catch fish up in the Box Canyon. Um, it wasn't easy. Uh, we were fishing from shore. Were they monsters? No, they were, you know, smaller fish tucked in close to the bank, which is where we could reach them. But drift boats um, on the, the far side of the river fishing these deeper seams were getting into nice fish the whole time they floated past us. So, so. it's a little, little tough on foot. Yeah. 
It is a little tough on foot. Yeah. Salmon fly hats should be happening soon on the Henry's Fork, and I hear that that's a good one there. It's already happening on the Yakima. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 25 fish per mile. You guys go catch your, your Yakima 25 fish per mile. I'm going to go to Mexico this weekend and do Mexico stuff. All right. Right. Actually, I'm preparing to go to my annual Yellowstone trip in two weeks. That's cute. It is cute. <laughs> I'm going to Montana this weekend. Yeah. There yeah. you go. And this is why you can't have a summer show, because we're out fishing. It's the price of fame. It is. <laughs> we're we're taking all our donations, all our sponsor money, and we're just we're dispersing and and traveling the world, living large. Actually, this is a work trip for me, <laughs> quote unquote. Not a, not an open fly work trip, an Allen work trip. So, mm. company trip to go down and try this year's new products and stuff and things. Sounds rough. It is. Well, we've got a couple more guests to get on the show. Let's uh, yeah, we do. let's move right along here. Yep. All right. Well, we're going to go to break, and we actually have double double trouble guide stories today. Two of them. Mm. That was Derek's idea. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. It's going to flow very nicely. And it, it will. It ties into exactly what we're talking about today. So Perfect. It's going to be a little bit of a, a yin and a yang, a little bit of a opposite views. It could uh, be. Yeah. Tenkara versus, versus bass fishing? <laughs> Not quite. Throw <laughs> down. <laughs> so, Derek, tell us a little bit about what to expect over the, the coming guide segments. Well, we've got two guests today. Dave Tucker, uh, who has guided on uh, what some would say is River X in uh, eastern Oregon. Which is um, accessed from Idaho. It's a- accessed from Idaho. Uh, we have Chris Hunt coming on today, who is uh, an author of a new book called Fly Fishing Idaho's no Se- longer secret secret water. water. So we're going to talk about the you know how how water gets developed, how businesses get developed, and how just like the Henry's Fork situation, where you've got uh, fisheries that are having uh, you know are struggling, and there's ownership that's taking of it, and it can improve. And we've seen that work really well, and we've seen that not work so well. So we're going to explore that today, and then how an author you know can come out and, and write a book about all the secret places. What what's the difference between a guide book and a guide? So that's what we're going to explore. Hey, all right. Yeah. yeah. Sounds awesome. We thought about this one. We did. <laughs> okay, we're going to go to break, and we will be back shortly with the guide segments. This is the Open Fly Podcast. We will return shortly. Now back to the open fly. And we're back with guide stories. Where did we go? Uh, yes, yeah, at every time. Mm-hmm. And I don't even think we left the room this time. No. No. I did, actually. So, uh, before going to the break, we, we, we said something that is no longer true. We said it was going to be a double guide stories day. It is no longer a double the guide stories day. Never the, nevertheless, though, it's an opportunity to talk about this issue because it feeds mm-hmm. into what we're talking about with Henry's Fork and with Chris's book. So yeah. yeah. So Derek, tell us a little bit about. So we were that. we were scheduled to speak with Dave uh, Dave Tucker, who guides um, or has guided on the Oahe, which is in northeastern Oregon, very mm-hmm. close to the Idaho border. Yeah, it's basically an Idaho fishery because it's pretty much cut off from the rest of Oregon. Right. So. Yeah. Um, there's really, really good water in Idaho, but for some reason, the Oahe gets a lot of pressure. And, and Dave is a friend of mine on, on Facebook. I've uh, never fished with him, but we've had some conversations. And I guess last week he, he wrote um, a post, and it's called A Confession of Sorts. And I think this is common with um, – I'm finding it to be more common with, with guides that um, are on a fishery and – it's really, really good, and it gets really, really um, fished a lot, and they build a, a strong business based off of that. And then all of a sudden, everybody knows about it, and then they start to see the effects of what they have been doing on the river system. And that's what I wanted to explore today, because Dave writes something that's very poignant in, in his confession of sorts, and, and I'll just get right to it. He writes, I feel extremely guilty and sad for my part in the degradation of this once fine fishery. This once uncrowded river corridor has turned into a circus. I have gotten to the point of dreading every guide trip I have to conduct there. When my contractual obligation with the buyer of our business is up, you will not see me on the Oahe again. Where we're at right now with the system is that it's it's uh, it's going to dry up. And as the, far as like from irrigation, from irrigation, okay. yeah, there's just not enough water. And mm-hmm. I, I fished this system back in March, and I drove through the night to get there. 
Uh, I've, I'd never fished it before, and I, all I heard was great stories about the huge browns, and everybody loves it. I saw these great pictures. It's a type of river that I like to fish, canyon, you know, nice small water, uh, wading only. I think you can float it at certain times, but, you know, I got there in the middle of the night. I took a wrong turn. I ended up on the top of this hill and in, in the dark and almost got lost, and I, I figured that's just part of the adventure. So to me, that was that's the kind of thing that I like. Mm-hmm. I wake up the next morning. Uh, you know, get out of the truck to, and, and wipe my eyes. And here I am parked at the base of this dam and the river is not anything what I thought it was going to be at all. Just very, very small. Uh, and I got in the truck and started driving downstream to find a place to fish. And, you know, he's right. There was, there was people there. There was, there was already pressure, you know, before the sun came up, I found a place to fish, uh, walked in the water, saw some, some Browns eating off the surface. Um, and I caught, a, I caught a fish and I left. It just wasn't, <laughs> wasn't what i thought it was supposed to be in other people's eyes this is a fishery that is um still their favorite place to go and it's a great place but dave is advocating he's taking a point that says i guided this thing for 13 years it used to be just you know me and then it grew into five guides and now all of a sudden this river is blown up and the best thing to do is to let it die Mm -hmm. so So do you think the guides and the pressure is the problem or is it strictly the irrigation that's that's multiplied by the fact that there's a lot of people on it. It's what I, it's what I wanted to explore today. I mean, mm-hmm. because here you have a person who is who built a business and built a life off of showing people this river, but yet it got to the point where he now advocates for it to go completely dry and start right on over. How or, do you mean? Just dry the river up and then fill it back up, yep. restock it, yep, with something. Yep, mm-hmm. that's his, that's his, that's the position he's taking. You don't think the fish that are in there would would bounce back if they just let the water stay and cut well, pressure? It, I mean. It, the Owyhee's, uh a different river based on locale. I mean, I did a, just a recreational multi-day float uh, years ago way upstream. We put in at Rome and fished down. It's not a trout fishery up there very very much. What's it, it, what is it like up there? Um, it, there's, you know, rough fish in there. Uh, there's bass. Um, kind of a slow, there's, you know, put it this way, uh, Anybody could row a personal watercraft through every stretch of the river where we were. Mm -hmm. Um, It was a nice, lazy recreational float, beautiful scenic canyon, but um, a roadless area. Mm -hmm. Uh, Below Rome, I don't think that there was any access until we took out. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Well, and the the point was I wanted to have Dave on to hear personally have him say, you know, hear the words and his voice around this issue because he is, it's in some ways taken responsibility for the state of this system but at the same time what i wanted to explore was the fact that he went from one guide trip you know him himself on this river to five guides and that in itself i don't think guide pressure i don't really think it has a an effect on the river it's when you take somebody there it's what they do after after that trip if they have a great time and catch a lot of fish one person tells 10 people 10 people tell 100 people and then Mm -hmm. You get to this. You, you've reached yeah. critical mass. Uh, on the on the trout fisheries, I, I think that's true. I think on a lot of Washington steelhead fisheries, um, there it's guide pressure because mm-hmm. you got certain rivers here where you got twenty guide boats going down. Each one of those boats putting in double digit days, and then like the one or two of us that are trying to do self guided can't even buy a fish. Yeah, because. The guys that are out there every day, you know, steelhead fishing, it's very spot specific. And those guys know exactly what rock to throw to. And then they move to the next one. And those of us that are not out there every day just end up, you know, getting scraps at best, you know. So it's a little bit different, you know, from fishery to fishery. But um, this one, yeah, I think it is more along the lines of of what you're saying. And I've seen the same thing in uh, where I grew up in Eastern Washington. There's a lot of uh, small streams that uh, myself and like Joe Wellauer, who we had a, on a few weeks ago, mm-hmm. grew up fishing. And back then, I mean, I didn't even think of these as secrets just cause I mean, I grew up out in the middle of nowhere and, you know, was pretty sheltered from the rest of the world and just had these, these little creeks and stuff that I fished just because that's what was there. And I kind of took it for granted. You know, I never fished any of the, the West Side Rivers or the Yakima or anything like that. Never saw crowds. It just wasn't part of my worldview at the time. And grew up fishing these little creeks, caught nice browns, you know, rainbows and all those things. And never really ever saw another person. Uh, and then I, I go away. You know, once I got out of high school, I go away, moved out of state, moved back in my mid-20s. And um, started thinking about these fisheries again and come to find out that there was a guide service back, you know, around the year 2000 or a little after maybe around that right around that time frame discovered these and started doing regular guide trips there Mm -hmm. and 
then another, you know, and then not only did were they just was it one guide going in there, it turned into them sending multiple guides into these little streams. And next thing you know, if you go to one in particular now, uh, one that, you know, again, I'd never seen anybody at, but you go there in the fall when things really start picking up, there could be a dozen cars hmm. at the pullout, you know, like the, the one that where you got to get in there. It's just one bridge that crosses the river that you can access and walk up or down. And, you know, you used to have the whole place to yourself. And now it's it's like a, a dozen cars or more. Mm-hmm. And mostly people that found out about it through the guide services or I think one of them actually put on a a, a thing at their their fly shop one time. They you know did a class on Washington State creek fishing and like handed out maps. <laughs> like, Rocky Ford will never be the same. <laughs> yeah, not exactly the one we're talking about, but yeah. yeah. Well, but, I mean it's it, so I've seen it happen, and the fishing sucks there now. Like there's no reason to ever go there now. Yeah, I don't think that you know I've I've gotten on the Yakima for six years, and I don't think I've dish, I mean I've added any additional pressure to the system. There's mm-hmm. days that I know are going to be crowded and there's days that I know they're going to be crowded. I tend to seek the places where there's not going to be a lot of people. Sometimes mm-hmm. that works, sometimes that doesn't. It's a pretty large fishery, too. I mean, it can handle some pressure. So, so yeah, in the Oahe is about the same miles in length. The, the, the quality fishing section is probably a lot shorter. Um, but to take that point where to just scrap the entire thing and start over, brown trout are an invasive species in northeastern Oregon to begin with. Uh, were they invasive or just introduced? They were they were introduced. But are they considered invasive? Are they a nuisance? Or? Well, maybe, maybe not to the anglers. But, okay. And, and there's rainbows in there as well. I don't know if those rainbows are introduced or if they were... Mm-hmm. You know, if they are part of a native stock, I mean, you know, you get you get salmon and steelhead all the way up into into Idaho. Why wouldn't they be able to get into the Oahu? Yeah. I don't know. But the, the point being is that is was the is the state of this fishery now the fault of a guy who started talking about it and taking people there, mm-hmm. or is it simply just a place where you run out of water? And um, I think they've had some fish kills due to mismanaged uh, water levels in the past, too, where yeah. they just and drew down the water so quickly that fish didn't move down into the channel. Mm-hmm. One thing I was hoping to find out about it, too, I've never fished there. I might be, I might fish it when I go to Boise later in the year, but uh, you look at the pictures of the browns in there, and they're super skinny. Mm-hmm. Like, they look malnourished and, mm-hmm. and pretty sick, <laughs> almost. Yeah, the one that I caught... Uh, didn't fight me at all. It was like it was like stripping a steak. Yeah, because browns in general don't fight like a rainbow to begin with. But then you get one that's even skinnier and, and less healthy, and then you're yeah. going to have more of an issue. But uh, I, I wanted to share one more thing from a recent uh, experience. Um, when I went to Utah in March, I fished the Provo River, which is just if you hear about Utah, you're going to hear about the Provo, or you're going to hear about the Green River. Those are just the two that everybody knows. And fished it and noticed. You know, the same thing. There's just pressure everywhere. Just just tons of guys. Uh, and, you know, the guy who was taking me around was telling me, yeah, you know, we'll get right up next to each other and fish. It's just part of the, the culture here because there's so many of us, especially during the summer. And But there was still every hole was full of, like, 100 or more fish. I mean, there was just so many fish. And I was kind of wondering why that is. And throughout the weekend that I was working there and talking to a bunch of other people that have fished it, it sounds like the middle Provo where I was fishing um, the first day, I fished the lower the second day, but the first day was uh, actually channeled at one point, like an irrigation channel. Mm. And uh, the, more pe- the, more, the more popular that that river got, the more pressure and the more advocates it had, the more pressure it had for, for something to change. And their advocates for uh, putting the river back in its, its natural channel, which still existed. It just didn't have water in it. Mm-hmm. And eventually they actually rediverted the river back into its natural channel, and uh, the fish populations exploded. And It's amazing what yeah. fish will do if just given a chance to Yeah, do it. so I, I thought that was kind of cool. You know, it, and it's, it's kind of the same thing where, you know, you got – uh, much more uh, a fishery that gets more popular and more popular and more popular. I think that's that's one of the few examples I've seen. Kind of like the Henry's Fork too, where it's the popularity that actually that actually helped it. So it kind of fits into the the theme of when's when's popularity beneficial and when is it yeah. Yeah. when does it suck? Right. Mm-hmm. Well, so. if if the state of Oregon is going to follow what we do here in the state of Washington, which I don't know that they will or not. I mean, this is about will that will the state allow the fact that they can sell a lot of licenses and a lot of you know supporting the local economies <laughs> by 
killing this fishery and then starting all over, will they will that be the path that they take, or will they take a path of, you know, maybe this is just a place where there there shouldn't be fish to begin with because we're running out of water and mm-hmm. it just goes away completely. Yeah, because it doesn't seem like there's a native fish population they're really trying to protect there anymore. Uh, no, not that I know of. Yeah, but maybe we'll find out. Yeah, I have yeah. no idea. Well, should we talk to Chris Hunt about his side of the story? Yeah, let's segue into, I mean, we're still talking about that very same point. He's written a book called Fly Fishing Idaho's Secret Waters, and Chris Hunt is a national communications director for Trout Unlimited. So um, some people view, and in fact, when I spoke with, um, you know, with Dave about this show, um, he expressed a very strong distaste for guidebooks or, or for books that, you know, that take the lid off of secret fishing areas. And what I was really honestly hoping to, to explore, and, and Dave, I'm sorry you couldn't make it, but what's the difference between a guide taking in people and having them tell everybody about it versus a person writing a guidebook and telling everybody about it? That's what we wanted to explore. So hopefully Chris will help us do that. And um, the fact that he's you know uh, responsible for a lot of the branding and the messaging and the content for Trout Unlimited, which is a cold water conservation organization, you know, does that mesh with writing books about secret places. So that's what we're going to explore. Sounds fantastic. We'll see. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, well, we'll let's get him on the line. Okay. We have Chris Hunt on the line. And just a little bit of background here. Um, Chris is the National Communications Director for Trout Unlimited, a cold water conservation organization. More recently famous for writing a book called Fly Fishing Idaho's Secret Waters. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks. Famous is generous. Um, but we'll go with... Uh, um, you know, name on a book, that's close enough. Same Kirk knows all about yeah, that. Kirk knows all about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So what I wanted to explore today, um, as for the listeners that are um, still on the line and, and hearing this, is we talked a little bit earlier about how a guide in Oregon uh, built a business and uh, developed a fishery that resulted in a, a coming to, I guess a coming to, terms of reality that it's no longer the way that it was because of all the people that fish it. And in your role um, at Trout Unlimited, and now contrasting that with your being an author that talks about these secret places, um, what what business do people have, do people have writing books about secret places and does that destroy fisheries or is there something else that's going on? That's what we wanted to explore. So welcome to the show. Well, thanks. uh, Thanks for that loaded question right off the bat. (laughs) We go right to the Um, point. (laughs) Yeah, you know what, though? I I have a completely different perspective. And and while I can appreciate, you know, the, um, I guess the place to start would be at the beginning where I have have a few friends over in Boise um, who have, uh, you know, good naturedly taken a few shots at me, uh, calling me a hot spotter and a dirty hot spotter, a filthy hot spotter, other four letter words that. Don't necessarily, but if you if you take a look, we're not regulated by the FCC, so feel free you can to say the words. Say the words. <laughs> no, no, I, uh, no, my boss might hear this. Yeah, Nobody listens to the show. It's fine. <laughs> okay, okay, that's good to know. Um, which is actually the reason I agreed to be on this. Show. <laughs> we appreciate um, that. That's no t- two cases of PBR. Okay. Um, where was I? Oh, shiny so, object. Uh, if you look at the book, there are twelve. I've highlighted twelve places in Idaho. Twelve places. There probably are 12,000 places to fish in Idaho, um, or at least closer to 12,000 than there are 12. Um, I divided it up by regions, four regions, and did three three stretches of water in each region. And one of the stretches of water, and you know, if you if you don't want to hear these secrets, just cover your ears right now. One of the stretches of water was the, the entire southern stretch of the Snake River. Uh, not, because it's, not because it's a secret, but the, the fishing for uh, for carp is somewhat of a, an unknown, and and quite honestly, it's pretty fantastic. It's, it Derek loves opinion. carp. <laughs> it's the closest thing you can get to saltwater fish without fishing in saltwater. Blah, blah, I mean, blah. they are they are incredible uh, incredible fighters, and, and they're you know they're discerning and difficult and challenging, and all those great words you would use about trophy trout on Silver Creek or the Henry's Fork or whatever. But you are a hot spotter. <laughs> Maybe the, the money shot may not be as, uh, <laughs> as awesome, but, um, you know, uh, one of the reasons, and I tried to outline this in my in the introduction of the book, was uh, we live in a place, I live in a place here in Idaho that is um, still relatively intact. Um, if you look at, you know, central Idaho, that used to be the heartbeat of the Columbia River. 
salmon and steelhead population. That was where the, you know, the the, the healthiest habitat still remains. Uh, the problem is we just can't get those fish back and forth to the ocean. Um, but the good news is uh, the habitat is good, and there are other things in there besides salmon and steelhead. And what we worry about, I think we, and I say we as the collective we and the, the conservation community, is that these places don't have the advocates they need. And frankly, the fish that swim in these waters don't have the advocates that they need. So if I can shed a little bit of light on a few places, and for clarity, I never once gave specific directions to any of these places. I simply gave a page in the DeLorme's Atlas and Gazetteer and said, it's on this page right here. So when you're looking for, let's say you're looking for the Wind River as it flows into the Salmon River, which is on a, on a, you know, a certain page on the DeLorme's Atlas and Gazetteer, you're probably going to stumble across five or six blue lines before you hit the one that says Wind River. Um, yeah, I'll say I was disappointed reading the book, Chris. I was uh, <laughs> I was expecting GPS coordinates and specific rocks to stand on. Well, I you know I had you in mind when I wrote that, Kirk. I was thinking, uh, you know, if I don't put the exact GPS coordinates for the nearest convenience store where they sell PBR <laughs> in thirteen packs. <laughs> then Werner will be disappointed. Yeah. So I, it was intentional. It was intentional. But you know, there are a few places, like I even highlighted one stream that I've hiked into now twice, but just because of the timing or the water flow or whatever, I've actually never fished it. And my goal this summer is to find a way to fish John's Creek, which is a tributary to the South Fork of the Clearwater. There's mm-hmm. a big secret for you. I've never fished it. I've heard that there are bull trout and west little cutthroats and red band rainbows in there but i have no idea it's beautiful i hiked five miles in there once in a pair of waders with eric barker from the lewiston tribune we hiked back in there step, stepped in wolf crap saw tons of white-tailed deer lots of elk sign and the water was so high we couldn't even get to the water to fish it so by the time we got back to the car and opened one of those pbrs which was found in candy eye kirk <laughs> Um, both of us were, you know, we peeled off our waders and we've been, you know, walking around in 75 to 80 degree weather all day in a pair of waders and take, peel those things off and your whole body smells like your feet and and you realize, you know what, I didn't I didn't even wet a line, but what a cool spot. And someday I'm going to go fish Johns Creek and, you know, I may or may not write about it somewhere. But mm. I guess my point is... Um, the more people who are willing to stretch their legs a little bit, get off the pavement and discover what places like Idaho have to offer, the more allies we have when it comes time to to beat back a bad idea or write a letter to Congress or write a letter to the governor or write a letter to, you know, there's a lot of madness going on right now, especially when it pertains to public lands. And I'm a big, big believer that public lands ought to stay in public hands and that and we shouldn't be fixing a system that's broken. We should maybe tweak a few of the weird spots. But, you know, we have national forests and we have national grassland and we have all this public land that belongs to you and me and every other American by birthright. And who on, in their right mind would want to change that? The challenge is showing people like us who get out and fish and like the backcountry what's there. And if we can get one or two extra people out there a year, and that's one or two extra letters to a congressman, and I'm happy to share 12 secrets in a state like Idaho. Yeah. So let's get back to the point made by, of um, advocacy. So mm-hmm. does a does a guide or a guide operation um, have to have that as a cornerstone of their of their business if they want to keep a sustainable fishery, or is that the responsibility of the angler and the conservation community? Um, is there a, a C, which is all of the above? Um, <laughs> well, sure, yeah. yeah I mean, I, uh, I, I've i been on many guided trips, and I've had different kinds of guides who have different uh, different levels of uh, you know, conservation acumen. Some of it is they just don't get it, um, but some of them get it uh, to an extreme. Um let me give you an example. Where I live here in eastern Idaho, the South Fork of the Snake flows, you know, right through my my town. And it is a beautiful, fantastic uh, wild trout fishery just full of brain dead with uh, Yellowstone cutthroats that love to hit dry flies. 
Um, it also has big, fat brown trout, and then it has a pretty robust population of rainbow trout. Um, the rainbows on the South Fork tend to uh, spawn alongside the cutthroats, and they create a not, uh, they create a fertile hybrid. So what we're seeing is, um, what we have been seeing is the um, sort of losing that genetic integrity of those Yellowstone cutthroat trout that made that river famous. Um, however, uh, you know, we, we to you, and uh, a lot of, you know, the Idaho fishing game and uh, all, a lot of conservation-minded anglers have recognized that in order to protect those, those native Yellowstone cutthroats, we have to actually catch and kill rainbow trout. Mm. Uh, and in a world where, you know, today's world where most of us who fly fish, I mean, almost never, if not never, come home with fish, um, keeping and killing a, you know, a 20 inch rainbow trout from the South Fork of the Snakes seems like blasphemy. Mm -hmm. uh, however, that's the right decision. Mm -hmm. That's the right thing to do. Um, and, and worse, you know, we have guides and outfitters along the river who wholeheartedly embrace that. And they, they kind of market that as to their customers as an opportunity to catch big rainbows and then keep big rainbows. Um, we have others who are, you know, there's no way in hell I'm killing a fish on this river. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, and, and uh, there, are other, there are other examples where you know, the, the conservation ethic uh, either goes too far or doesn't go far enough. I think the challenge for guides and outfitters who make a living on the resources to find that sweet spot and understand that without intact habitat, their opportunity goes out the window. And without that opportunity, guess what, guess what else goes out the window? So, so uh, there's, yes, yeah, so there's a place for systems like, you know, I, I think one of the, the coolest things that's come out recently with, along with the dam issue with, that movie Damnation is, it's not that we hate dams, it's that we love rivers. And th right. that idea of, you know, it's not that we don't, um, it's not that we don't love fisheries that are artificial, it's that we love fisheries that are wild more. So is there, is there a, a place and should we, should we fight for places like the Oahe that get over publicized, overfished? Should there be a place where people that outside of Boise and Northeastern Oregon and wherever else can go and catch big browns in a, in a canyon that's, entirely artificial so that pressure isn't put on other places is, is that fair to say sure i mean I, you looked at uh the, the oahe is one example of a, a you know tailwater where trophy fish live where if mother nature had her way it would be full of um well knowing that territory pretty well probably wouldn't have too many game fish in it at all maybe mm -hmm. bass all mouth um <clears throat> but you know there there are uh, contrived fisheries all over this country, ranging from the, the Chattahoochee River that runs right through downtown Atlanta. It's probably one of the best urban trout streams in the country, and mm -hmm. it's in a, a state where, you know, sometimes the humidity and the temperatures are in the 90s at the same time. And I've actually pretty, fished that river, strangely yeah. enough. Well, congratulations. Now you've just sold out Georgia's fishing. <laughs> <laughs> We talk about all these waters. all these trout <laughs> rivers, and I'm just like, yep, never been there, never been there. I'm like, oh, the Chattahoochee, I've actually been to that one, which is the most random one to have been to. Right. But there are, you know, there are rivers in Arkansas and Oklahoma and Missouri um, that are tailwaters. There's no way in hell those rivers would have trout without, in Texas yeah. without the dams behind those uh, behind those lakes. And, of course, those dams were built for different reasons. They weren't built to grow, to make trout fisheries. That was sort of a happy accident. You know, they realized, oh, this is the bottom of these dams. Let's put trout in here. They'll do well. And, man, have they. Yeah. Uh, so, you know what? I, I'm, I think, you know, given the reasons for those dams and the construction of those dams and the fact that there are fish, there are cold water fish below them, that's just, uh, you know, that's one of those things that, uh, you know, I think – has it just happened over time with the demand for, you know, roadside fishing opportunity, mm -hmm. et cetera. Yeah. Um, I, I get the idea that the Hawaii probably shouldn't be like it is. I mean, there's, I'm sure there are people out there who think, you know, that is a contrived fishery. Let's make it, let's, you know, let's return it to its natural state, whatever that was before. Um, but if that means, you know, that, uh, Everybody from Boise gets to drive to the Oahe and has to walk 50 yards to the river to fish, and they don't get into the back country, and they don't pressure the Middle Fork or the South Fork. Some other names I should, should I should give up here? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just 
saying they're great places to fish all over this country, and, and there's there's sort of a flavor for everybody. I mean, I look at, um, all right, I'm going to, now, Kirk is a big fan of the Firehole River in Yellowstone National Park. Um, there goes Wyoming. That's F-I-R-E-H-O-L. <laughs> um, the Firehole and the Gibbon come together and make the Madison. Those are three, you know, three fabled western rivers. Um, but before, you know, we took the, you know, the, the white man essentially took over the, uh, the Madison. Excuse, you know, yeah, that's offensive to me. <laughs> Caucasian American. I apologize. Uh, uh, I, I will I will say, uh, you know, pale face. <laughs> um uh, took over management of Yellowstone. The, the fire hole was not a fishery. It was fishless. Yeah. Um, and the reason it was fishless is because it was thermally influenced. And in the summertime, and Kirk, you know this as well as anybody, if you showed up late in the season, it's terrible. It's terrible fishing. All the fish have gotten the hell out of there, and they're up in the tributaries where the water's colder. Yeah. Only at the beginning of the season, and then again at the end of the season, when the you know the weather, weather helps push that water temperature down to that ideal stretch is that a real quality fishery. And there are places on the fire hole where you can fish and, you know, have a, a chance to catch a brown trout on your forecast and an R V on your back cast. <laughs> you can have. Um, but then there are places where you can also, you know, walk two or three miles away and be in this really cool country that um, you know, you can experience almost nowhere else on earth. And there are big fat brown trout in there and some rainbows and really good fishing, especially, uh, you know, early and late in the year. But um, it wasn't a fishery before we messed with it. Right, and yeah. nobody in their right minds these days would say, ah, you know what, let's get rid of that. Let's, let's return the fire hole to its fishless state. Yeah. Or the, you know, or the Gibbon or the Madison. Think about that. Madison is, you know, there's not a native cutthroat left in the Madison or a native grayling left in the Madison. Hmm. You know, you can still catch a white fish every now and then below the lakes. I had a uh... I had a young couple from uh, from Texas on my boat a couple of weeks ago and um, asked them about their their previous guided trip experiences and which was you know which was their best experience they had and the guy told me that he had a hundred fish day on one of those types of systems in Arkansas where he all he did was catch big brown trout and I'm like wow that's you probably didn't even have time to eat lunch what'd you have for lunch he said subway sandwiches <laughs> and I, I laughed. Not brown trout. <laughs> right. Well, I, I laughed because, you know, in my dry box in my boat, I've got, you know, chairs and a table and a tablecloth and silverware. And I, I cooked them a nice meal in the river. We didn't catch 100 fish. They were close to that. But there are places where you don't, it doesn't matter what else you do if there's, if you can catch 100 fish in a day. Yeah, you can feed your guests. You can feed your Subway. guests Subway sandwiches. You can call them in the morning and say, hey, what, we're, I'm planning lunch. What do you want from Subway? There's, there's fisheries that you can do that on, but yeah. and we have to appreciate those fisheries. It sounds like that you're saying or agreeing with me is that we have to appreciate those ones because they take a, they take a very valuable role in keeping the other places a little bit more wild. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. But I also would, I would add to that and say, and try to encourage people to explore a little bit. And maybe mm-hmm. that's just, yeah, I think all anglers are like that. Hunters, not so much, but anglers like to wander and experience new water and, you know, see new things and sort of check things off their list. I mean, how many of us in our head have sort of a species list? Oh, I've never caught a mm-hmm. jack, you know, a, 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 you know, a horsehead jack or a permit or Chub. You know, a poultry out or a chub, you know, whatever. <laughs> I'm sorry, Shad. You know, pikeman. I almost, I almost said the other word, but pikeman. Um, <laughs> you know, we've already said it on I this said episode. It earlier. It's okay to say it. I said uh, it. Squawfish. <laughs> oh, my word. You know what's funny is I, uh, before I. 16th of American Indian in the. <laughs> One, uh, back before I bought this house, I, my apartment was on a creek, an urban creek that was just stacked with those things. And you, you think when you think a place that's stacked with them, you think like, oh, they're going to be eight to ten inches long because that's usually the way you see them. I, I got them on the regular upwards of twenty to twenty five inches. So I would actually, I, I would go out with a with a streamer, like basically like brown trout fishing, and, and strip streamers to catch big pike minnow, and it was actually pretty cool. Huh. Do you want us? Um, here's, here's another secret that is not in the book. I'll just share it with your listeners and their listeners only. So now's when you hit the record button, folks. Um, the Payette River between McCall and 
you know, south to Horseshoe Bend area is a great place to catch bike now on the on the fly. Like yeah. big girthy ones. Yeah, big nice. ones that just you know. They're over, I would say there are probably too many of them. Yeah, so if you, either of you guys want to want to check out the secret fishery for 25-inch... Uh, Why don't you uh, just broadcast the name and sell that one out? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, the Sammamish right. River. Oh, <laughs> it's actually, isn't it the Sammamish Slough? Uh, it's yeah. officially the Sammamish River, but it's also called the Slough. Yeah. Yeah. But there's only like two spots where they stack up, and nobody's going to figure that out. Yeah. Well, let's get back to our, our guest, uh, Chris Hunt. Um one of the things, and I read the book, and I I read it cover to cover. Thanks for including a lot of pictures for him. It made it really easy. Yeah, pictures are good. Um, I one thing I liked about it is that aside from you know getting some good information, it's really well written. Um, you're a good storyteller, and so I wanted to read just a little excerpt uh, for our listening audience. Rashid. I no, I, I I I actually did go through the book with a highlighter and a red pen and uh, marked up he, some errors. He flushed but... it. He flushed it. <laughs> um, an, an excerpt from Fly Fishing Idaho's Secret Waters by Chris Hunt with a foreword by Kurt Dieter. Rashid leaned against the wall in the VIP section, sipping on rum and coke and trying hard not to stare at Bria. Her short dress was hugging her lethal curves. <laughs> And he wanted to take it off and wrap her cocoa legs around his waist. <laughs> shades of I tell you what, I just saw that. I just looked online and the sales went through the roof. <laughs> so that's like Fifty Shades of Grey. Not that, secret fishing. So that's an actual excerpt from Chris's book. I, I may right. have actually. I think I grabbed it. I'm, I'm reviewing another book. I grabbed the wrong excerpt. <laughs> Well, in all in all seriousness, here let's get back to something about conservation. That was pretty serious. Yeah, it is pretty serious. So let's talk about conservation. No, serious. Yeah, conservation really quick. So, it, it's my personal view that if you're if you're guiding on a river, then you should be also heavily involved in conservation. If that's not part of your day, then you are doing yourself and your guests and the river system you're on a huge disservice. Yep. Um, one of the things that Trout Unlimited is trying to do is to, um, you know, gain more members because the the more people that care the the better off it's going to be so what role do you know in your role as communications director for for Trout Unlimited what role do, does the local chapter does the the state chapters all of that play and and what is Trout Unlimited going to do with um you know with with books like the, the secret waters do you, do you try to funnel people into conservation organizations with books like this or what's well, the spirit, what's the spirit um, of that for us, okay, and let me, you know, let me just, a little bit of background on to you. We, you know, we're the, we were founded in 1959 in Michigan by a bunch of anglers who were worried about their water and who were concerned about the future of their, of their rivers in Michigan. Um, and that is, you know, today we have 158,000 members, I think, which uh, is great. Don't get me wrong, it's wonderful, but I think we should have three or four times that many. Um, and we need to build that TU army, that grassroots army. Um, you know, we face a lot of challenges as a conservation organization, um, not the least of which is that, you know, like, like many organizations and many, uh, you know, join groups out there, we're, we're aging. You, you know, I don't know if you guys have walked into a TU meeting recently, but it, you know, put yourself in the, in the shoes of a, you know, late 20s, early 30s something, um, man or woman walk in by yourself to a TU meeting and you see a bunch of people um, who probably look more like, uh, you know, like me or some of my or older, you know, with gray hair and, or you could see the four octogenarians in the corner tying flies that look up and give the stink eye to everybody they don't recognize. It's not, you know, sometimes it's not the most welcoming atmosphere and that that's something we have to change from the inside. Um, what we also have to recognize is that uh, and I was giving a talk to uh, the Grand Valley Anglers chapter of Trout Unlimited in Grand Junction last month, and I had the mic in front of the room, which is dangerous for just for anyone who's interested. It's dangerous to give me a microphone uh, first because it's shaped oddly, and I don't like having <laughs> things like that so close to my face. But um, <clears throat> second, um, I asked these I asked these folks, how many of you, by show of hands? Joined Trout Unlimited to uh, to build, you know, because you desperately had this deep seated desire in your heart to build crossbuck fences along trout streams. Obviously, nobody's hand goes up. 
I said, how many of you joined to you because you wanted to go babysit a bunch of third graders while they watched eggs, trout eggs hatch in, a, in an aquarium, and then eventually watch those fry develop, and then you can go with them when they turn these uh, fry loose to be eaten by the brown trout in our local, local stream. Nobody's hand went up. <clears throat> I said, how many of you joined Trout Unlimited because you like to fish? Everybody's hand went up. Fishing is the front door to Trout Unlimited. So that's what we as an organization have to have to remember, that as much as we want to protect and reconnect and restore these fisheries around our country, if we don't have anglers involved from the start, then we're lost. Uh, and I think that goes that holds true for you know any organization, any advocacy organization that protects opportunity. And that's what we do. We protect the places that you love to love to fish. So our challenge, of course, is to to grow that PU grassroots army so that it's more effective, so that when we put out an action alert, instead of 10,000 letters to Congress, we get 50,000 letters to Congress. Or, you know, we have, when we have chapter meetings, 300 people show up instead of 80 people. You know, um, banquets and expos and all that stuff that's centered around fishing, that's where, that's our sweet spot. And if we can't, uh, you know, first identify the anglers, and then, you know, bring them aboard. The conservation thing can come second. I mean, you know, we're full of volunteers who spend their weekends building those crossbow fences or planting those willows or manning the, the kids' station at the expo or, you know, working with third graders on trout in the classroom projects. They love that stuff. But that's not why they came to you. And I don't think that's why many people join organizations. Um, they have that, that protect opportunity. They have... They have that love for the, the craft, for the pastime. The love for the resource comes next. And that's where we have to, uh, you know, we have to get more of those people who fish. And there are anywhere between five to seven million people in this country who fly fish for trout. How cool would it be to have half of those people signed up for TU? Half of them write that $35 check every year. Mm, yeah. That'd be pretty sweet. Yeah, I think a lot of people worry that um, giving to large organizations means that their dollars doesn't trickle directly down into the resource. Um, I, I know that there are some large organizations where you can donate and your money hardly gets to the cause itself due to administrative tasks and whatnot. But right. with TU, um, how much how much of my dollar actually makes it to the fish? Uh, we're a, we're a five star charity. Um, Eighty nine percent of the money you get to PU goes to the goes to protecting and reconnecting and restoring the resource. That's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Is there something is there something in the book that um, talks about um, any contributions to conservation organizations that uh, in Idaho or is there a cause that you that you wrote about in the book? Um, you know, I, I I talked a lot about. Uh, what we've done over the last, what TU has done in Idaho over the last 10 years, and the biggest thing we've done to protect habitat and opportunity in Idaho is was work with uh, all comers on Idaho's roadless issue. Uh, roadless is, you know, seems like a simple issue, um, but it really means is backcountry. And you know, I'm of the mind that once you punch a road into the backcountry, you're no longer in the backcountry. Um, and we had, we have in Idaho, about 9 million acres of inventory of roadless land on the U.S. Forest Service land. That's, for perspective, that's more than twice what Montana has, more than twice what Colorado has, almost three times what Wyoming has. Um, Idaho had, it has the, the largest swath of undeveloped backcountry in the lower 48. Only the Tonga Forest has more unroaded backcountry areas than Idaho does. So in 2004 and 2005, we set out to find a way, um, because of the, you know, the, the complexities of politics and the way public land's been managed uh, up until the early 2000s, <clears throat> there was sort of an all-or-nothing approach to roadless. And President Clinton put in the 2001 roadless rule toward the end of his term, and you know that just blanket protection for some 58 million acres of roadless land across the country, including all of Idaho's roadless land. President Bush came in and in 2005 introduced a new rule that said, hey, you know what? States get to decide their own, the, the fate of their own roadless lands. Only two states took them up on that, Idaho 
in Colorado. And both states have, now have new roadless rules that are probably better than the original one um, because they, they protect these lands uh, for the, the, the fishing and the hunting and the backcountry resources that they possess. But to you and a, a friend of mine who was kind of you know, the hard charger behind protecting Idaho's backcountry for generations and generations to come is a guy named Scott Souter. And Scott lives in outside of Riggins, Idaho, on a mountain between the Rapid River and the Little Salmon River. Um, both are excellent fisheries, in case you hadn't heard of those two before. The <laughs> Might as well add them to the book now, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and we worked with, at the time, um, you know, the Mayor Kent Thorne had been appointed to the Secretary of Interior job, so we had um, we had a short time there, seven months, with Governor Rich. And then, of course, Rich was um, elected to the U.S. Senate, and then Otter came in. And Governor Otter kind of left that roadless ball and go in uh, Senator Rich's court. So Senator Rich and Scott Stouter and a lot of folks from various um, interests and activities and industries in Idaho, including mining, timber, cattle, uh, um, obviously fishing, off-road vehicles, hunting, all got together in a you know over a series of meetings held back in D.C. and one was held in. Oh, gosh, I think we had one held in Salt Lake City at a U.S. Forest Service office there for some reason, maybe one in Denver. They were held all over the West. And um, in time, you know, in 2000, I think it was 2007, that road, Idaho Road, this rule became the, the law of the land. And, and in doing so, we protected, you know, nine hmm. million acres of backcountry in the state of Idaho. And that's what, you know what, that's what this book is about. It's about the backcountry. And... You know, you stretch your legs a little bit, um, you'll experience some things in this state that you can't find anywhere else. Hmm. And that's that's what we, I really wanted to explore today was the difference between, you know, writing a book about secret places that are hard to get to and contrasting that with, um, you know, guiding for 13 years on a system that now you lament having done so and, and telling people about it. So there's... It, it seems to be the, the thing that, that the common factor is that you love a place and you want to tell people about it, but actually caring about it is it's got to be the second step after the first one yeah well if you don't have people who care about places and you don't have advocates for these places when the time comes to fight for them yeah. agreed well we'll see yeah. what happens in uh in idaho huh yeah <laughs> and yeah we're gonna have, Oregon, yeah. yeah we're gonna wrap this up uh chris we definitely appreciate you coming on board and, and sharing your story with us yeah Thank you, Chris. Well, thanks, you guys. I appreciate the opportunity. And for both of your listeners, I, I hope they got a lot out of it. <laughs> <laughs> right on. <laughs> yep. Thank All you, right. sir. Appreciate it. Yeah, take care, Chris. Yeah. All right, guys. Take it easy. Uh, bye-bye. Wow. Did, I, did you think he'd ever shut up? <laughs> <laughs> he hey. wrote three books. Yeah, he's, uh, he's a passionate guy when it comes to uh, conservation and and what have you. Mm-hmm. And he does guide too, correct? I don't think so, no. Oh, okay. No, he just he wrote about places that um, he, he likes to go to okay. and wants to go to. I mean, so not, not an official guide, but he wrote a book that guides you to things. Yeah, I don't think he would have time to guide, and I don't think anybody would pay to fish with him anyway. <laughs> but he owes us, well, I'll take the payment in beer. Yeah. Didn't we win some sort of bet? What was that bet about? No, I won the Super Bowl. Yeah. I, I chimed in because you were betting PBR. Yeah. Are you guys betting on next year's Super Bowl with him yet? Uh, well, if he stays a Broncos fan, he's going to lose again. Yeah. <laughs> well, you'll, you'll have two games preview. Uh, we'll see. In the regular season. Yeah. No, one preseason, one regular. If you, I mean, have, I don't pay attention to sports ball. Yeah. Yeah, look at you. If you have thoughts on, if you're a guide and you have thoughts on, you know, can you love a place to death and should you care for it more? Um, you know, did Dave do the right thing? Um, did Chris do the right thing as an angler? You know, you probably have your secret spots um, where guides are on the river, and maybe you don't think that's the right thing. But start the discussion. Give us your feedback. We'd like to hear about it on Facebook. Maybe someday you'll be our featured guide on the show. Maybe. Go out and uh, pick up Fly Fishing Idaho's Secret Waters by Chris Hunt. Um, uh, form your own opinion. Yep. Yeah. 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 And I got to say earlier that I mentioned that the foreword was written by Kurt Dieter, and I want to apologize. That's Kirk Dieter. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you have some other excerpts in there you were you were going to share with us? I don't know if we got to them during the the interview. Um, we can we can discuss them amongst ourselves. Well, pretty much that was 
the only one. Um, the <laughs> night before, he couldn't sleep. The that, thought that she actually needed and wanted her flames of desire extinguished <laughs> prevented him from resting peacefully and filled his mind. <laughs> Uh, All right. Well, we got a long, hot summer coming. Yes, we do. (laughs) Yeah, sultry. Thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks for thanks for sticking with us over the last few months. It's been a it's been a time. It it has been a time. It's only going to get better. It it will. You know. this hiatus will give you a chance to get caught up and and go back and study through, you know, because we actually do have a plan for those of you that are up to snuff on your your open fly knowledge. Yeah, you're going to have to study every episode. Yep. To so, win big. Yeah. Just to clarify, not up to snuff, like not killing people, just like no, no, we don't, we don't have to no, keep that. Not a snuff podcast. No, no, no. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, maybe. I don't know. Maybe we'll be the first podcast to air a human death on the air. <laughs> <laughs> I know some people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's a goal I want to shoot for or not. <laughs> yeah. We'll get you on your bikinis and get your cold drinks out in summertime. Yeah. So yeah, we're we're gonna continue to, to feed you content as we can we can put it together and as you know, as we can come together to do it this summer. We just we're not gonna commit to a schedule because we can't because we're very busy over the summer um, with our our real jobs and our our trips and our families and our things and our stuff and the, you know. And quite frankly, everybody listening is very busy too. And yeah. so, if we put out really good quality shows, they would miss them. Yeah, they'd miss them. So yeah, yep. Anything you guys want to do? Sign off with any? any, well, any other? Just to our advertiser and our, and our sponsors and our listeners, thank you. It's been fun, and it's going to get a lot better. Oh yeah. A year from now, or two years from now, we're going to look back and be like, "What the hell were we doing back then?" <laughs> Sitting here in our three-piece pinstripe suits, mm-hmm. puffing on large cigars. Perhaps yeah. we'll have an intern or an assistant. Yeah, we, we're. Yeah, that is on my on my list of things to do is acquire an intern. So, I don't know what they're going to do. I don't really have a job for them yet, but I will find some. Maybe we need to hire somebody to actually, uh, you know, book the guests and everything for us. So a we, booking agent. A booking agent. Yeah, we need a booking agent, a producer. Send your resume. There we go. Yeah, just one, one last thing we have to do. All yeah. right. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll pay you as much as I pay myself. <laughs> You'll, we'll get the same salaries. They're a little are we open, incentive for Are you. we open to hiring Canadians? Uh, yeah, work I don't think so. Okay. Keep it, keep it uh, inside the borders. Oh, yeah. The Made week. in America. They took their germs. their germs. Because yeah, I know people are just going to be fighting over this one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well. Uh-huh. Get yourself well, seen on the corporate jet. It's yeah. about to take off. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess we'll be back when we come back. Yeah, we'll see you later. Bye. Yeah. All right. Don't leave your fly open all this time. No, I think they should. All right. Well, we appreciate you all. There are many fly fishing podcasts on the Internet to choose from. This is one of them. Bye-bye. <laughs>